Okay, uh, Vice Chair, would you like to call us to order and get us started? Yes, let's call to order. I'm gonna start roll call. Yes, um, Vice Chair Junio. Present. Uh, Commissioner Hobson Cord. Present. Uh, Commissioner Delgadillo. Present. Uh, Commissioner Perez. Uh, Commissioner Sanders. Present. Uh, Commissioner Yi. Here. And Chair Cancino. Yeah, again, hopefully uh, the chair will be able to join a little bit later, I'm not sure. Um, and also we're joined by our guest presenters and also Captain Adam Plank from the police department. And as always, Chief Campbell's here. So just wanted to recognize. Thank you for doing that, Amy. Um, I think as usual, um, this will be a moment to check if there's any public comment. Yeah, I don't see anyone from the public in attendance. Okay. Um, Vice Chair, we also have the land acknowledgement and the agenda review. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and read that since um, that was not uh, organized ahead of schedule, so. We want to acknowledge that we gather in San Mateo County on the traditional land of the Ohlone peoples past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We honor and respect the Ohlone people's long history here that reaches beyond European colonization. We honor and respect the indigenous people who lived and continue to live upon this territory and whose practices and spiritualities are tied to the land and its other inhabitants today. Thank you for reading that, Vice Chair. Um, and for agenda review, here's the agenda for today. Um, if we have the approval of the minutes, then there's the scorecard that was sent to you all, an email um, for your use so we can review that briefly. We are joined by Allison Nakayama from Berkeley's mobile crisis team to get a presentation. Uh, we'll follow with a commission discussion. Uh, the recess is on the agenda. And then the long awaited data presentation from Captain Plank and James Pine, um, Dr. James Pine and discussion of that. And then quick updates from staff. So that should be the agenda for today. So we'll just take a few moments to review the, the minutes. And I apologize, I don't, I'm working off on my phone here and uh, uh, trying to make sure we stay on, on point with the agenda. So Amy, please correct me if I'm out of step anywhere at any time, um, just please let me know. Yep, I think you're right. Uh, minutes approval of minutes is next on the agenda. If anyone would like to make a motion, Stephen, well, I'll motion. Thank you, Stephen. Do I do I hear a second? Yes, I'll second that. Thank you. Mary Jo, do you mind taking the vote? Yes, uh, roll call vote. So um, Chair Junio. Oh, sorry, Aye. Vice Chair Junio. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, I knew Commissioner that. Yeah. Uh, Delgadillo. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Hobson Cord. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Yi. Aye. And Commissioner Sanders. Aye. Okay, so uh, minutes 
approved. Thanks, Mary Jo. Um, Vice Chair, I believe the next item is presentation of the scorecard. Okay, thank you, Amy. So we, we were all sent uh, previously an email that had the, the scorecard attached to it. I hope everyone had a, an opportunity to review it uh, so that we can just make quick comments on it and, and then proceed with the rest of our agenda. I will pull it up. So as uh, Commissioner Yi had asked for um, something to help evaluate the presentations, um, for now, uh, this is a, a little bit just um, descriptive information, kind of gathering what you think about the presentations. As we continue, we might wanna create a scorecard that's more um, assigning numbers and values and points to things. But for now, just to help evaluate these presentations, we sent this out for your use. You should have it in Word for Mary Jo last Friday. So the questions, the prompting or guiding questions are, what do you like about this program? How does this program differ from the South San Francisco program? What is something new that you think South San Francisco should adopt? What challenges does this program have that we can learn from? And how, how is this program funded? And what other assessments you have? So if it's useful for you, please feel free to reference this as you're hearing expert presentations. And um, we've also discussed with the chair and vice chair possibly having subcommittees go back over some of the presentations we've had thus far to apply these questions to them as well as we're processing all of these amazing presentations and information we've gotten from everyone. Um, oh, I'm sorry, did we wanna open it for any feedback or questions on that before the next agenda item? Okay. Yeah. We can move on to the next item, Amy. Great, next we have the presentation on Berkeley's mobile crisis team by Allison Nakayama. Um, Allison, welcome, and whenever you're ready, I can pull up the slides. That'll be great, Amy, thank you. <clears throat> um, would it be helpful to have a little introduction about myself before I get into this, or leave that to later, or not at all? Oh, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you for okay. offering, yeah, please. Oh, sure. So my name's Allison, it's nice to meet you all virtually. Um, I am the mental health program supervisor for the crisis services program of Berkeley Mental Health. So um, the city of Berkeley is um, one of the few cities, I think, in California that has its own mental health and public health departments. Um, we work in conjunction with, Al with our partners in Alameda County, um, but we do have our own mental health uh, clinic here, um, and that also houses our mobile crisis team as well. Um, so I am the supervisor that oversees um, uh, that program in addition to um, the, the the three teams that are on that right, within that program. All right, so um, whenever you're ready, Amy, that'd be great, thank you. All right, so um, just a general uh, table of contents uh, regarding uh, some of the, the topics I'll hit on tonight. Um, I will say that the Slides are uh, super brief, so um, if there are questions um, that you have about specific things, um, as I'm talking about it, feel free to stop me. I'm happy to answer questions then. I can also take questions at the end too. Um, either way is fine. Um, next slide, please. All right, so our Berkeley Mobile Crisis team has been around since the 19, um, gosh, late 70s, I believe early 80s. Um, so prior to that, um, the city, while still having the uh, the clinic services, um, was also noticing that there was um, an increase of folks who were in the community, unhoused, generally unhoused, um, and needing some support with 
uh, connection to services and also having a lot of contacts with both the criminal justice system, either via arrest or the police 5150 um, folks. Um, and so this team was was um, uh, was put together uh, to, to address that issue. So a lot of this was um, with the um, deinstitutionalization of uh, state hospitals that happened um, uh, in the 60s and on to the 70s and 80s. Um, and just we're seeing more and more folks having um, the increased police contact. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the program was a pilot project initially in 1979, and it was called the Berkeley Mental Health Police Pilot Project, um, which was a, uh, I think it was like a one or two year pilot program. Um, and so a um, mental health clinician was paired with a, a Berkeley police officer, um, and they responded to call um, <clears throat> together. Um, that then moved into our own Berkeley Mobile Crisis Team, which is um, housed and run by Berkeley Mental Health um, and the city. And we work as a co-responder model and in conjunction with the Berkeley Police Department. So our team is uh, made up of two staff people who can respond to calls during the day. So they have a police radio. They can get called directly from um, by the dispatcher to respond um, to mental health crises in the community. Um, individuals and the community can also call the, the team directly to request, um, you know, welfare checks, to request 5150s, to request follow-up, um, and those we, we coordinate with, uh, with the dispatcher um, to make sure that there is an officer available who can respond with us um, for, for those calls. Uh, so during the day, staff uh, can go up by themselves um, to respond to calls with the officer. And then at nighttime, um, they pair up together to be able to respond. And, that's, was, and that was due to a safety issue, um, an incident that happened with staff um, a few years ago. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our team has, it is budgeted for four, four staff and that's including three, three licensed clinicians. Um, so these are folks who are licensed social workers, licensed marriage family therapists, um, licensed psychologist, uh, and then also licensed um, professional counseling. It's the new one, it's the LPCC uh, license. Um, and, uh, and, and one uh, supervisor um, who, can, who does part-time administrative, part-time clinical work. So doing a split shift. Um, I will say that within the past uh, four years, um, we'll be going on to five years now. Um, the team has been very short staffed and has been really running only at half, half staff. So with only two licensed clinicians. Um, we've been unable to hire a supervisor um, and the third clinician um, for that position. Um, but we are going to be doing some um, restructuring um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some folks um, onboarded soon. Um, so because of that, um, our team is only able to work five days a week. So Monday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, and Sundays um, from 11.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, as I said, uh, this, during the day shift, the staff runs from 11.30 to 5 p.m. You have the two staff who can uh, respond to calls. And then from 5 to 10 p.m., they, they come together to, uh, to respond uh, after that. Um, in the past, we have been able to run um, seven days a week. Um, from 11.30 to 11 p.m., but again, because of our staffing challenges, um, we are currently only able to do five days a week. Um, and actually, right now, we are only down to one full-time staff, um, and then we are supplementing with um, hourly staff um, and also um, some staff from the clinic who are um, wanting to do some overtime. So we've been, we've been doing that as a way to supplement. So that's kind of where we're at at this point. Next slide, please. Um, so the goals and our purpose of the global crisis um, are really to provide um, resp first responder and be part of that um, that first responder, um, including fire and um, and police, um, whenever there are um, situations that occur in the community that could be mental health crises. Um, we also work to to support um, diversion from the criminal justice system. So if there are frequent um, people that are having frequent contacts with the police department, they will often um, refer them to us or let them know when they're having contact with someone so our team can respond um, and kind of work to figure out ways to support them, either getting into treatment, um, reconnecting or connecting with their, their current um, or former providers, depending on the circumstance. 
Um, which, and one of the nice things about our team too is because our team is part of mental health and not um, part of the police department, we have access to all the same records um, through the county so we can see where, where folks are um, connected to other service providers, either here at our clinic or if they're at a different clinic within Alameda County, um, we can see that and then work to make, and then the clinician can work to make those um, reconnections and letting people know when they've been having some contact. Um, we also hope that by having our team available um, that we can help to reduce the number of crises and um, emergencies that are in the community um, by doing trainings um, and supporting and consultations with, um, with family members, with other community agencies, um, hospitals and other, and other groups. Next slide, please. All right, so in addition to, um, to our, our mobile crisis team, which like I said is, is the oldest one around, um, there are gonna be two newer uh, crisis response <clears throat> teams and options um, here in Berkeley. So the specialized care unit um, is the one I'm gonna talk a little bit more um, on some later slides. Um, so this is uh, a con new contract that the city of Berkeley um, has with Benita House, and they'll be providing um, the non-law enforcement option of having a clinician, a peer, and a medical staff person um, to be available to respond to crises in the communities without the police. Um, and so if you want to, would like to see the, the full uh, recommendations from um, our, uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, of our, uh, uh, contract with, um, with, uh, with another partner um, who's done some uh, data collection for us um, and has provided, um, gotten feedback from different community agencies, the community as, as a whole. Um, I provide that link so you can look at that final report um, for the SCU. Um, and then the uh, UC Berkeley. So historically, Berkeley Mental Health has also responded to, um, to UC Berkeley. So, so calls from Berkeley, uh, uh, the University of California Police Department from Berkeley can also call mobile crisis to ask for some assistance too. If there's somebody on, on campus property um, who's having a mental health emergency. Um, so the university is creating their own version of mobile crisis that will be a non-law enforcement uh, response option. So again, um, some similarities to the specialized care unit and uh, other um, agencies in the area that are providing a non-law enforcement response. So I provided a link to to their uh, dashboard as well. Um, I, I do attend meetings uh, regularly with, uh, with their lead in that program and they are in the process of, um, they finally, I think, got their approval from the Regents, Board of Regents, and so they're moving forward with, uh, with getting that process started um, to get that team going for, for them and what that's gonna look like as well. All right, next slide, please. All right, so the Specialized Care Unit. Um, so as I mentioned, um, there was an RFP that had gone out uh, to the community last, earlier last year, I think maybe in the spring. Um, and so the contract um, was, was awarded to Benita House um, in December of 2022. Um, Benita House is a nonprofit agency um, that is predominantly in the East Bay. I don't know if they're, they're elsewhere as well, um, but they're predominantly here in the East Bay um, and provide um, mental health a uh, variety of mental health services. Uh, so doing community-based work, doing crisis work. Um, so they have been in a contract with Alameda County um, who's had their CAT team, which is the crisis assessment transportation team um, uh, for a while. That's currently a pilot project, but I believe they're going to be working to get that as a permanently funded project. Um, so that uh, the city awarded that contract to Benita House, um, as I said, in December. Um, the contract was finally signed um, earlier this month, and so now Benita House is going to be um, moving forward with um, just the operational planning and structuring of what the team and what the program is going to look like. Next slide, please. All right. So in the um, the report, um, there were like I think I believe 22, 24 recommendations, um, key recommendations for for the SCU. Um, I won't go through all of them, um, but they are all uh, listed here on the slides. Um, but I wanted just to kind of hit on the, um, the, the main points that um, have been really coming up a lot in the community. 
Um, so it's really wanting the SCU to respond to mental health crises and substance use um, crises um, without a police co-response. That was that, that's kind of the big one that the community has been asking for. We also really would like the, the team to operate as on a 24-7, 365 schedule and to have a three-person uh, staff, uh, three-person staff. So as I mentioned earlier, a licensed clinician, um, a medical person, I believe they would, uh, they would, they had been hoping to get like a nurse practitioner to be able to prescribe medications and do that. But I don't know if that's going to be what, what comes out. Um, but that, that was one of the asks that the medical provider be able to um, prescribe medications in the moment. Um, and then also um, a peer responder as well um, to help folks who are going through um, a really challenging situation. Uh, they were also hoping um, <clears throat> that this team would also be able to provide transportation to and from um, not only emergency room situations, but also to our crisis residential um, units, um, the crisis, stabiliz crisis stabilization units, and uh, the crisis residential programs as well. So Alameda County has one crisis stabilization, which is a voluntary placement that folks can go to get um, mental health services. Um, and there's also three crisis residential treatment facilities that people can stay and spend up to two weeks at. Um, another big ask um, was for um, the team to have a live 24 seven, uh, 10 digit phone number that was not uh, through 911 um, that folks could call and, and speak directly to an operator, a dispatcher who was not with the police department to be able to dispatch um, the team uh, as well. And this uh, program would be an, an addition to the mobile crisis team. So we would continue to operate as a co-responder model and the SEU would respond um, as a non-co-responder model, but that we could work in conjunction together um, depending on the situation. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, and so another ask or another uh, request that folks had wanted was to have um, uh, an open portal uh, to be able to uh, review the data um, collected by the SEU um, and to see kind of how that's, that's working overall and also to um, continue to have the uh, steering committee, which has been in operation for I'll take a good guess that it's been at least a couple of years. May not, it, it may have been longer, um, but they would like to have that steering community continue to advise um, the SCU um, uh, as, as possible. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So this is the proposal that was provided from Benita House. Um, we had, um, I'm sorry, the our, our health housing and community services department um, manager. And um, Benita House did a joint um, community presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, I think, um, just to kind of keep people updated about where things are with the SCU. And so at that time, they are anticipating a launch date of 2023, uh, sorry, summer of 2023. Um, that is also dependent on just, you know, if they're able to get staffing in place and um, just equipment and, and all that kind of basic stuff. Um, and so, like I said, the three-person team of clinician, EMT, and a peer um, who can do 5150 evaluations um, oh, and also help support people who are voluntarily seeking services. Um, they would also like to have them able to provide some basic medical services and linkage to both mental health and substance use treatment um, and options as well. They are hoping that the team, uh, each of their three teams could work 10-hour shifts over the 24 hour period. And then that would allow for overlapping between, um, between the, 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 the three teams um, to make sure that there's proper coverage, proper follow-up and the like. All right, next slide, please. Um, the, how they're gonna take referrals, they mentioned, um, will be through the 10 digit hotline that I mentioned. Um, referrals, they cost possibly can get referrals from 911. Um, that is still being worked out of how that's what that's going to look like and how that would be kind of coordinated. Um, and then also um, on view by just going out and looking for, for folks who might need some support and services out in the community. Um, they are currently working on a protocol about how to receive the referrals from 911. 
Um, and as I said, starting this month, um, they will have the monthly updates um, to the community about how things are progressing. Um, and they continue, they will, they hope to continue to do that, I think, for the duration of the, the pilot project. Um, so the pilot project itself, um, it is uh, grant funded uh, for one year. Um, and I also believe that there is some funding, in addition to the grant funding, there is some funding, I believe, through the general fund, um, but I would have to double check that to, to make sure. Um, after that, then um, there would need to be figuring out some ways to how to fund that um, permanently. But for the next year, it will be funded. All right, next slide, please. Um, Allison, we had a raised hand from one of the commissioners. Oh. Would you like to take a question now, or would you prefer to go to the end? Absolutely, I can take it now. Oh, thank you, Allison. Stephen here. And uh, uh, clearly appreciate you sharing your time with us. Uh, two quick questions. And actually, the second question you, you touched on, and maybe you can just clarify a little bit more. The two questions, one is about the third bullet point on the current slide in terms of community updates. I just wanted to get a better understanding of uh, the nature of that. When you mean community, how, you mean the entire community, certain portions? How's that communication management? And, and you know, what, what does that what does that really mean? And um, and and the second point is, uh, and you touched on it a little bit. If you can, uh, I think if you can clarify just one more time for me about the funding, the allocations. And I, I think you said you about to have a year left. Then you cut. It sounds like that's not clear what's going to happen in terms of funding. Is that what is that is that what I'm sensing so far? That, that is correct. That is correct. Yes. Um, so let me answer that question first, and I'll get back to the other one regarding the community update. So the, the grant funding, I believe when they first put this together, it was um, estimated um, that the project for funding for a year to fully fund it for the year in which um, that they were hoping that it could be done was going to be between eight to $12 million um, for, for one year. Um, and so, um, like I said, there is grant funding um, currently um, for once. I don't know if once if that's got well, gone once into the project has actually started or if this is the brief thing to I that part I, I would need to get some clarification on. Um, and then also some general funds, I believe, that are coming from the city as well. Um, but yes, in, in to answer your question, it, it is unclear it's where the additional monies are going to come after after that first uh, first year of uh, of being in service. Um, and then regarding the community updates, um, the uh, Office of the Manager for our for our Health, Health and Community Service Department. They've been working with, um, uh, they have a, a, a senior management analyst who's been doing, who's been basically the project manager for, for this project and, and this contract and working with um, both the city council and um, now Benita House to, uh, to you know, get, get things going and get things moving. Um, so they've been doing a lot of outreach, I believe, to the community. Um, they've been putting out flyers. I know we've gotten some from the manager. Um, so we as a clinic are providing that to um, to our clients, to family members. We've been having, I believe, copies of that available in the lobby when people come in. Um, and that was also provided in our um, uh, monthly uh, wellness committee, or, sorry, wellness um, group um, schedule that gets mailed out. So that is um, participants in that um, can be clients of our clinic, but they can also not be clients of our clinic. They can just be anybody who identifies with having mental health um, challenges. So all of that information was provided to them as well. And I know um, the uh, consumer liaison who's in charge of our wellness program has been doing a lot of work to get that word out as well. Um, and I believe all the information should be on the city website um, and they should have links to the Zoom meetings from going forward. Any other questions before we move on to the next slide? All right, next slide, please. All right, and that's it for me. Um, this is my my uh, my contact information. So if you have any questions um, that come up later on or would like to get some additional information, please don't hesitate to uh, to contact me. Um, I'm happy to answer myself if I don't know it or to uh, to direct you in the the way in which you're going to get a better response um, if I can't provide that to you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Allison. Um, I see that Chair Cancino has been able to join us. 
Um, I'm just wondering if the chair would like to open it up for questions from Allison. Yeah, we could definitely open it up for questions. Thank you again, um, Allison, for coming for coming on and presenting to us. I think uh, um, something that I was trying to con convey to the team or, or you know to the commission was that your your um, your guys's model is it, it it seems very comparable to ours, um, and and seems like within reach for for us. So I think. It's great. It's great that you're here and being able to um, present that. So, but yeah, we can we could definitely open that up for questions for anybody. Does any does anybody have any questions for Allison? Um, I know I did talked about the funding for the SC year, but I, I and I know from your. Um, on your table that there was questions around funding. And I, so I can talk about funding for our, our mobile crisis team as well, if that's useful to know. Okay, um, so our mobile crisis team is funded by a variety of sources. Um, the majority of our funding for, for the program comes from um, MAW billing, which is, oh gosh, I can't remember what it stands for, um, but it is a portion of um, Medi-Cal that uh, provides uh, some reimbursement for, for outreach for crisis response. Um, and things like that. And so the um, majority of our funding come, does come from that. We also can get reimbursement from Medi-Cal for folks who are open to um, to our, 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 and one of our service teams. And so if one of our clients, our current clients at the clinic has contact with mobile crisis, they can directly bill Medi-Cal for services just like their social worker would bill for direct service. So the psychiatrist will bill for a direct service. So they can do that as well. And there's a small portion of the funding that also comes from the city's general fund. Uh, but the majority of our money does come from the mob reimbursement and the medical reimbursement. I, I have a question about that, Allison. As far as like mob billing went, so they call you guys directly now, right? But 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 I think do you guys also? It might have been something that I missed. You guys also get dispatched by by um, by operations as well, or by by uh, by the dispatch by nine one yes. dispatch. Yeah, that is correct. And so um, folks can call. We have a. Um, a phone number that folks can reach us on. Um, it is unfortunately a voicemail um, and we will work to return phone calls within, you know, as soon as possible because staff are out in the field responding to calls. Um, and so we've done that. Um, and yes, if they're uh, in, the, in one of the outgoing, in the outgoing message, it also does say to callers that if this is an, uh, an emergency and you need somebody right away, then call the, you know, Calling nine one one and asking for um, from a mental health, me the mental health team, mobile crisis team to respond to a mental health emergency. So, so with that, if if the referral is coming from dispatch, do you still do mob billing, and 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 is that more so because of the referral from dispatch to you guys? Yeah. So, so folks, um, so mob billing allows us to get referrals from from various sources. Um, but we, but it has to be a direct uh, client contact. So it can't just be a consultation with um, with the police officer regarding a, a call that they had before. It can't just be with a family member per se. It has to actually be um, uh, one to one with the the client um, or the identified client. Um, and we can provide those services both in person and via phone currently. Okay, perfect. So okay, and then when you are, let's say it's like de-escalation or something like that, and you guys are able to do that via telehealth. Um, I'm assuming you could do mob billing for that, but um, would you open up a whole chart for that and, and bill Medi-Cal anyway for, for the evaluation? No, so we only open, we, so the um, all of that is only done if, so I'm sorry, yes, we, we can't, we can do an, a whole, uh, oh, like a, a, we call it a hot shot or one shot opening and closing for that same day. So if somebody has a mental health crisis and they, we know that they have Medi-Cal, Alameda County Medi-Cal, we can go ahead and do that one-shot billing um, to bill Medi-Cal directly for that service. If we cannot verify that a person has Medi-Cal or it might be somewhere else, then we will err on the set of caution and, and just do the, um, the, the MA billing. Well. MA billing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming that's for private as well, right? Like Correct. Yeah, okay. it's also private. We, we don't do any, um, uh, any private insurance, it is just um, uh, Medi-Cal 
Um, so it's just and, well, and Medicare too, but um, it's prominent if someone has Medi Medi. Med 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 uh, but if the patient does have private insurance, that would 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 that stop you from making contact? Okay, so no. then you would just do mob billing for that then. Yes, yes, we we, we will still we will still respond to anybody, uh, whatever their insurance status. If they have insurance, if they don't have insurance, we will still provide that service to them. We just won't bill any insurances directly. It'll all be mob, correct? Okay. Hey, Crystal, Allison, I I know you're getting in technical clarifications here. If you can help me up uh, back back up a bit. Mom billing? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I was trying to see if I have the actual printout. That's what it stands for. Um, it is, oh, I really wish I knew it off the top of my head. You can, you can, I'm so sorry. You can simplify it. No need to. It as like a general fund, right? Like, so every every city, every county has general fund, and there's like a, a, a certain amount of dollars that behavioral health can access through through general fund. And so when they do mob billing, because it's really difficult to, um, to I, don't, I don't know, like verify for like licensure or anything like that. The, and, and, and again, like the state understands when it comes to mental health that um, sometimes it's just, it's, there's all these other services that crisis has to bill for that doesn't quite fall underneath you know, a specific diagnosis or even trying to diagnose somebody or anything like that. And so mob building is a way to kind of uh, re reallocate all those funds. And so city clinics will use that quite a bit. Um, and so when we're talking about funding, and, and this is why like understanding and knowing how our city can bill for, for mob building is because then that would help us with trying to figure out um, the, uh, what's it called? The budget for for you know whatever we're trying to do in the future it's it's just a way to like get money back if we can't bill a private insurance then then we would bill mob billing if we if somebody doesn't have insurance and we can't bill medical or medicare well then we would just do the general fund great i appreciate that and if you can help uh not not both does both in my head here um yeah conceptually that makes sense so, so thanks for so so uh, <clears throat> Are you saying mob billing or mob billing? What, what does this stand for? <laughs> and yeah, if I missed something that was shared before, then that's then it's on me. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah. M A A. Yeah. <laughs> so so what is, does it stand for? Something specific? Sorry. It's um, medical administrative activities. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So it's like, you know, paperwork, phone calls, like, like anything that's not billable, um, that you can't attach to a diagnosis, right? It's that's like good. the whole insurance game thing. So, right. And actually, I do have a side question to that. But do, between you, Crystal and Allison, was there something that you wanted to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, continue on before I ask my question regarding that, or billing in general? Well, well, I'm just curious with that, because you know, when, when they do go out with police, because because I'm assuming that the police, you know, also are getting billed for that, but I don't I don't think they're getting re reallocation of services, right? It would just be behavioral health at this point. Yeah, so I I, I don't, I mean, I, I believe the majority of the, the police um, budget does come from, from general funds and from other different, you know, grants and, and task monies that they get. But in terms of the, the services that um, we are, that are provided, in conjunction with the police, we are the only ones who are billing for that service. If 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 if, if that is so, what we end up doing because we can, um, you know, we we know someone's medical status or even the, the mob billing as well. That's all directly done directly by us. Right. And then, do you do you bill for the officers and and for mob billing as well? No, just for the clinicians. No, it's only our clinicians. Um, if we have interns, um, the interns can bill for that as well. But it's just a staff who are um, assigned to mental health. Got it. That's good to know. Thank you, Allison. And, and if I may add to uh, that, and, uh, or no, uh, may I just squeeze into? Uh, okay, uh, just briefly then. You know, in terms of the billing, uh, from your experience, Allison, how efficient and effective is this whole billing, cross billing? I mean, is it is it like lag time that is seriously frustrating? That's almost not worth the effort, if I'm just, if I may, or, or do you see certain learning saying, hey, there's a better, much more efficient uh, quality audited kind of process 
that you said that you that you can clearly see that it's not there yet. I ho hope that makes sense. No, it does. Um, and so I, I think in answer to your questions, um, Steve, Stephen, um, it was we were only doing mob billing. Um, it, so when I when I first came to the clinic uh, 16 years ago as an intern, uh, that was the only kind of billing that we we're doing. We we're not doing any kind of direct service billing, even if it was somebody that we knew who had Alameda County Medi-Cal, we didn't do that. Um, a few years ago, um, something uh, changed, at least from, from our perspective, when then we were able to, to go ahead with that, or we started doing that because maybe we could always do it, I'm not sure. Um, but that was something that we started doing to do those one shot or those hot shots for folks that we knew um, had Alameda County Medi-Cal. And so then we've been able to get some um, funding in through that way as well. Um, so that, that's actually helped um, increase our, our, our revenue for that. Um, I would say that the turnaround time for that is is always delayed as as, as it is with Medi-Cal, um, but but we are able to get that, which is which is helpful for the program um, and for the time. Thank you. Go ahead, Arnell. Oh, thank you, Crystal. Uh, hi, also, so I just I have a couple of questions. Um, Bear with you. I'm kind of looking for my notes. You had mentioned, um, I think it was, I can't remember where in, in your presentation, but you mentioned there was uh, a 24-7 coverage um, for a phone service. Um, trying to, I'm not sure where it was in your presentation, but it was, I'm trying to find it, so I apologize. But you, it was one of the um, recommendations. Um, that there would be a 24 seven operator or, or, or that someone could call into to this, to, to the uh, facility, I, I suppose, and that someone would be available 24 seven. Is, is that something the clinician or the medical professional is expected to do? Or is that an additional, um, is that an additional employee? And that, that wasn't clear to me. Yeah. Um, so that that was that yeah that, that was the recommendation from from the um, the various um, focus groups and committees for for the SCU that they have a, a 24 seven um, responder to answer the phones. Um, I think they've been talking about having like an actual operator who who does that who then can um, you know inform the, the different teams about uh, about a call where to go and to do all of that stuff. I don't believe they were thinking about having like the clinician or any of the the actual direct line staff um, who would be responsible for responding to that to answer those calls. But I that part is is where it's it's um, still to be determined. But I believe they would like to have, have a separate person to be able to answer those calls. Um, and so yes, that would be so because the they would like the um, various SCU teams to be operational twenty four seven. Then yes, that that phone service would be available for that as well. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Of course. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Elson, uh, thanks for coming. My question is around the recommendations. How likely uh, is it that those recommendations will become policy? Yeah, that's a good question. That that came up during the meeting as well. Um, I I would hope that the majority, if not all of them, could could happen. But I, I think in reality, it's it's still to be determined. I mean, I I think if I were to be a a, a guessing person, um, I I would guess that the priority would be to have um, um, staffing for the twenty four seven three sixty five coverage, um, and then to have um, folks. Have the have the the wide uh, breadth of um, medical clinician and peer as well. Um, that that is just my guess, um, but I hope that those aren't the those aren't too uh, too high hanging fruit um, that can't be um, can be reached. Um, I think that that is really what, at least in the meetings I've attended, what I really hear from the community of what they're looking for. So I, I hope at least those things can be uh, uh, obtained and and more to more to be revealed. Who would determine that? How 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 would it become? How would they become? Sure. 
Um, so I think it, it'll at this point, um, because the uh, Benita House is saying that this is something that they would like to, to do as well, and they, they want to do it. I think a lot of it depends on if they're able to hire for all of those um, folks and, and to get enough people to do that. So I think some of it will be determined on just the general hiring. And um, as, as you all may know, um, it's been very difficult to find um, clinicians and experienced clinicians to do crisis work, particularly. Um, and so we'll see kind of what happens with that, but I, I hope that that, it won't be too much of a, uh, too much of a difficulty in, in kind of getting all those folks hired. Thank you. Sal? Addison, so, um, why do you think you're understaffed and is do you uh do you have a high turnaround rate? Um I I think the, the overall, I mean, I've I've I certainly know kind of our, our challenges here, you know, as as the Berkeley for Berkeley Mental Health as a whole, our division has been, I think throughout the pandemic, it's the worst it got was was 40% vacancy rate. Um, we have been able to do some more hiring recently, so that's gone down a little bit to, I think, now 30%, which is still not great, because, again, when I first started 17 years ago, or 16, 16 years ago, um, it was it was not like that, and things have changed uh, a whole lot. Um, so I think that there's, um, there's the general staffing issues um, that all... Um, you know, sort of health service agencies have, have been dealing with. Um, I don't know if there's particularly things within the city of Berkeley. I know, um, I, as I mentioned that for, for your jurisdiction as well, um, hiring for any kind of city and county jobs um, is very difficult with the HR process and, and all of that. Um, so I know that can certainly cause some difficulties um, with kind of getting people um, hired and onboarded in a in a quick fashion, um, unlike the private sector, which can happen you know really quickly. Um, so those are my kind of my guesses as as to the the current challenges um, as as to why people are not coming into wanting to do community mental health. Um, it's always been a, a challenging field to to kind of recruit for, and I I think the pandemic and other um, issues have just make it made it even more um, slim picking. Is, is what I think, but um, yeah. I can kind of talk about this too. Like we, as far as San Francisco crisis, we had 16, 16 vacancies for the past two years. So it, it, it is a nationwide thing about not having enough clinicians. You barely have enough psychiatrists and now you have nurses and doctors also quitting their jobs too. So I mean, the health the, the health industry in, in general is definitely getting hit and really short staffed. Um, but, you know, that that also goes into San Francisco, just because I know about San Francisco as well. But even their law enforcement, there are about 600 officers down as well. So just like nationwide, like there's there's a lot of jobs and. Um, yeah, not 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 quite sure as well, but historically crisis has always been really difficult to staff naturally <laughs> um but yeah that's like a typical thing but it has increased since the pandemic that's for sure so you're not alone in that allison <laughs> berkeley's no different san francisco's the same way it, it's an unfortunate uh, uh group that we all have to be part of but yeah, so glad yeah. To yeah. yeah. did you have a follow-up question sal Um, I would just, uh, wanted to, I had a question around relations, um, from MCT, from the mobile crisis team, and, uh, if the relations have improved, uh, like, between, um, the, you know, Berkeley Police Department and, the and the clients or the community. Sure, I can speak of that too. Um, I, I will say because mobile crisis has been around here in Berkeley for so long, um, I think at this point, all the officers are are, are very familiar with with uh, with who we are and what we do. Um, they are very um, quick to uh, to refer people to us to give us heads up about different folks to you know um, who they're concerned about. Um, 
And I, I will say too that there are, I don't know the current number because um, uh, uh, Berkeley Police used to have an officer who was um, a, a CIT trained officer and had been kind of taking the lead with making sure that all of, um, all of the folks within the department were CIT trained. Um, since he's retired, I don't believe that they've been able to find a replacement for him. Um, but I know that, that that is something that historically has been something that um, officers have been encouraged to, to, to attend and, and encouraged to follow through with. Um, I would also say too that um, because we do work in that co-responder model, there's a lot of learning that can happen um, from, from, from both sides. Um, and so officers often will ask lots of questions around mental health diagnoses. They'll ask questions about why did we do this versus why did we do, why didn't we do that? Um, you know, and so I, I think for folks who are curious, there's lots of opportunities for, you know, for them to learn and for us to learn kind of the, the, the law enforcement side and to understand components of that too, which I think can certainly help the clinical work with clients. Um, I would also say too that, um, again, historically, um, the, the police has, because we go out together, um, I think, I would say that it can be it can be challenging for uh, for folks to um, engage with with mental health at times because we do respond with the police. So I, I won't um, say that it's it's not it's never an issue. Um, it certainly is and certainly can be. Um, I would also say too that there have been times where folks because they have a lot of contact with with law enforcement too um, that people can respond better to to them versus to us. So it's a it's been a, at least that's just been my um, my uh, my observations when I've when I've uh, when I've worked, um, and so it's just an interesting kind of dichotomy to see, um, and that it's it's just you just never know. And so I think um, with us having um, continuing to have mobile crisis and continue and then having the SCU having both um, options, I think hopefully will be the best of both worlds that um, you know people can have what what they need in that moment um, to make sure that they're safe and that the community is safe. Amy? Um, thank you. That also speaks a little bit to my question, um, which was just, so in South San Francisco, we're kind of looking at what kind of model do we want to adopt after the pilot program? Do we want to co-respond with police? Do we want not to? I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on the distinction between the MCT responds with police and then the SCU responds without police and kind of what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different programs? Sure. Um, as I understand the recommendations, um, you know, part of the component of, of the SCU with, with uh, having that, that onlook um, component of, of going out to, to look at people to um, look for and respond in the moment. I think that those, that can be helpful because um, mobile crisis, again, because of the way we are structured and, and due to the lack of, of, of staffing, we don't have the ability to go out to start outreaching and to start looking for people who might need um, support um, to help de-escalate um, or to help prevent a, a crisis from, 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 from forming. Um, so I think that that is a, a big component of the SCU and I really hope that that can um, be a portion of the work that they do. Um, I would also say, and, and, and then my hope is that, is, uh, conversely, is that they will then be able to help get people connected into services who may not already be connected um, or to do that work too. Um, and so while mobile crisis can do that, it's, I think it's the going out to look for people aspect that I think is, is I, I'm very fascinated by and I hope that that can come to fruition. Um, the other component of mobile crisis is that there are situations where, while there are lots of situations that can be dealt with without a police presence, I mean, I certainly think about um, as clinicians, when they're dealing with clients who may be escalated and, and having a lot of mental health symptoms or, or just not in a good space, um, you know, we don't call law enforcement to help de-escalate them. We will work to de-escalate de de them ourselves. If things go haywire, then yes, we can. Um, we have the option of doing that. But the idea with SCU is that they can also help to support that de-escalation before something else happens. Now, we know that um, there are often times where Folks were 
where there are situations where, where safety for both the clinicians, the, the identified client and the community is, is, a, is a concern. And so I think having the co-responder model helps with those situations to help with that. Now, again, hopefully those call, those types of calls are less, um, would become less frequent um, by having both uh, teams there. But I think that, that that's an important component as well, where um, they're, I guess it's, it's, the, it's a whole time and a place thing, right? It's like, you know, what, what, do, what, what does this, this one situation need? Like, let's look at this. What can we respond to? What can we have that's the, the least restrictive? And that we also know that there is another model that can be available if, if things go, go badly or something else, something else happens, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Allison? I had a question. Um, Go ahead, Paul, buddy. What kind of qualifications do you have to have to become a mental health technician? Sure, absolutely. So for um, our, our mobile crisis team, um, all of our um, full-time uh, staff and our hourly staff currently are all licensed um, are licensed uh, clinicians. So they're either licensed psychologists, licensed social worker, licensed marriage and family therapists um, by the, the Board of Behavioral Sciences or the um, Psychology Board. Um, and then we also you know, look for folks who have history of being able to do crisis work or have had that kind of experience. Um, and so a lot of, I, I would say the majority, at least in the past, majority of, of our folks have had some crisis experience in other previous work environments, and then mm -hmm. maybe not so much, and then have just done a lot of on-the-job training. So it's kind of been a mix. Um, I will say that for the hourly staff, all of the hourly staff that we currently have, um, and including one of our full-time staff, have all been interns on our mobile crisis team. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of um, folks that way as well. Okay. Um, is there a big difference between the psychiatric technician and a mental health technician? Um, so if you're talking about like a licensed uh, uh, psychiatric uh, technician, so an LPT, is that mm -hmm. somebody who has a license to, um, I think they can do medications and other kinds of stuff. I believe they're, they're licensed by the nursing board, but I don't quote me on that. No, they are, they are, you're right, Allison. Okay, okay, yeah. thanks. Um, and so um, our, our staff is, we don't have um, mobile crisis team. They don't have a medical component. They're all just clinical and are licensed by the board of behavioral science. Okay. All right, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Paula Clyde. Any Anybody sure, else? Thanks. Do you have any questions for us, Allison? Um, no, I just, I, I appreciate you for the opportunity and, and thank you for asking about our program. Um, I, I wish you good luck um, as you, you look forward with, uh, with your process too. Okay, cool. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, if you're open to it, we may ask you to come back because we might have questions in, in, in the future. I think once we kind of get down to the grind and really trying to figure out what our recommendations are for, for city council, we might ask you to come back if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. And then I hope by that time, um, the RSU will be up and running too, and then I can uh, get my compatriot um, on that side to, to come as well, if that would work. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Cool. All right. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. All right. Have a good evening. Bye. -bye. Cool. Um, so with, um, again, just to kind of reiterate, I know Amy went over it, but um, you know the um the, the questionnaire the survey stuff make sure that you guys are filling that that out i know that we're kind of like backdating it in a way but um we just want to make sure that there's like a standard of questions or a standard of information we're getting from each one to kind of help us like organize our thoughts around things so cool definitely appreciate that all right amy um next on the agenda we had agendized um, just discussing the presentation. There don't want to oh, be any more discussion amongst commissioners. Yeah, perfect. So cool. So yeah, we could start that now. Um, what are your guys' thoughts about Berkeley? I think I've been very open and honest about Berkeley. I think, you know, if we were going to do like things in stages, Berkeley would probably be like stage one, in my opinion, about, you know, um, 
how we can expand the, 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 the program, the community wellness program that we have already, but um, Matt, what did you guys think about that? Thoughts, comments, questions? Crystal, could you say a little bit more about what makes it a good stage one kind of thing and why it's adaptable? Yeah, absolutely. One, they already work with SFPD. So um, I know that all the other ones also are not SFPD with, with law enforcement. I know that all the other, you know, some of the other crisis models already do work with PD as well, but um, they, they they hold the radio, which Mika already does. She she's also ha has a radio. Um, they go out in teams of two, which I think would just be like an additional person to, to Mika. And I know, um, you know, just from experience, having two clinicians on, on site is really important as far as safety, being able to, um, you know, really have somebody else to consult with about a case, just because sometimes de uh, depending on if you were, if you were going to 5150 somebody or 5585 somebody, sometimes some of these cases are so gray. Um, and so not really being able to like rely on another clinician can kind of be difficult. Um, their team is much smaller. I think uh, they're, they're not housed with, with law enforcement. I think they have like a separate, they have a separate phone number, but they're also housed in a separate building, um, which I don't think would be that much. I really like that they do mob billing. I, I know San Francisco doesn't do mob billing anymore, but it, it is definitely one way to make sure that revenue is still coming in. So if, if we did present to um, city council about, hey, you know, like here's the budget that, that's currently happening right now. Here's how much we're getting from county. Here's, here's how much the city has been contributing. If, if we can show some kind of data, you know, or at least showing, hey, here's, here's some opportunities for us to reallocate services or to, to reallocate funding, um, and that's through mob billing, um, then I think that would also be helpful to sustain the program as well, or to sustain all of these, um, <clears throat> you know, um, additions or, you know, ho however we want this to expand or the expansions. So I, I definitely like that. And again, like I said, it's, um, it, it's nothing that South San Francisco and the police department aren't already doing. So, right, like they, South San Francisco is already getting calls um, that, that Mika could go out on. That's nothing any different. I think getting, getting a separate phone number would also be good. Um, and I don't think that costs too much, but, um, yeah, it just seems like in, in terms of all of the different crisis teams that have presented to us, this seems the most attainable. They don't have, um, uh, licensed psychs techs, which means, um, they don't have medical staff, which can cost a little bit more. Um, they don't have the fire department, which can cost a little bit more like, like the SCRT model or the cahoots model. Um, and then they also don't have, um, a peer, which I think also kind of like changes things a little different as well. Cause that's also the cahoots model. Um, it seems a little less, uh, it's not as complicated as Alameda County, right? Alameda County had all these different teams and depending on where you are in Alameda County, it depended on what team went out to you and determining on what kind of service or what kind of referral that needed to be done. It also differed on what kind of team needs to do that for you. So I thought that was also qu quite confusing. I mean, our, our city is very, um, Berkeley is very small. I feel like South San Francisco is kind of comparable to that. Um, I don't exactly know what their population is, but I'm assuming it's not, you know, not not as crazy as San Francisco versus South San Francisco. Um, but yeah, I think those are just the little things that I've like noticed that would be attainable for South San Francisco and why that would be like a stage one kind of thing. Um, and I think all of you have noticed too, like going into crisis, there's a lot more to think of than just responding to the public right and like being there in that crisis moment there's um and even defining what a crisis is and i think alameda did a good job of defining that for us was it just depends on all like what kind of crisis is this a mental health is it behavioral is it adult is it 
Um, is that adult um, possibly, you know, have some kind of cognitive, be, uh, cognitive um, thing going on as well? It just like it just depends. But I don't know. I might be going into too much detail now, but that's the gist, I think. Um, and again, I like that they do mob building because that is a huge thing as far as being able to reallocate um, any kind of funding. Thanks so much for sharing all your thoughts there. We definitely are all benefiting from your experience in the area. Yeah, 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 of course. Steven, go ahead. You could you could freely talk. You don't have to raise your hand. Oh, thanks. It's discussion time. Thanks, Crystal. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, of course, you know, as I'm each session, each group, you know, learning, relearning, learning, relearning, and uh, relearning what I relearned. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I, I'm still, you know, and, and scorecard, aspect I think it's going to be very helpful for us um there's a couple and one thing I realized I wasn't clear on maybe some of you caught it much more clearly uh I, and maybe maybe can tie be a tie back to a point on the scorecard uh is um and, and let me let me step back a little bit there's this in my head here I like I, for my brain I need to simplify my head <laughs> um and I know this is a very complex and uh, you know, matter, of course. So there's efficiency and there's effectiveness. And I appreciate your commentaries and your insights, Crystal, and, and especially with the efficiencies of work systems and mob building and all that intricacies around that. Definitely you've got domain experience. That's huge. Um, the other area that I'm not maybe uh, that I don't think I'm have done a very good job is getting a really good sense across the different agencies, at least I've directly heard so far, maybe there's the prior ones, about how about coming back to cons consistent understanding of outcomes. How are they defining and hitting and communicating clearly their effectiveness in the programs? Um, I, I'm just saying in general. So, and uh, what, is there consistency of that or does it vary? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I realize that I'm struggling with that and maybe I'm, maybe it's there, it was spoken to, uh, but th there's a lot of data on activities. Does that make sense? And I'm not, I'm, no, I'm just wondering, and maybe some of you see much more clearly, what's the data on impact on outcome? Uh, and so if we can hold, yeah, if we just sit on that for just a moment, it, it, can somebody help me with that? Yeah. Um, I could, I, I definitely have thoughts of that, but if anybody else does too, please go ahead and interrupt me. I know I talk quite a bit, but. Um. Hey, Crystal, I, I think um, that, I don't know how to describe it, that, that information that, that Stephen might be, and, and myself included, and probably for that matter, the wrestlers are looking for, probably doesn't come from um, data from the police, because so these programs that we're that we're viewing, that we're reviewing, and considering whether in whole or in part to create to create one for for the for uh, city uh, South City, um, I think just to if you want to check on its effectivity, or how effective the program is, we would have to look at police data. I think such as like uh, you know has. Um, whatever has has the use of force gone down you, you know something along those lines and it might not be um might not be able to draw a, a straight nexus from that one data source to another but i think that would give us like shed some light as to how effective the program is so i'm just speaking random so let's just say there was whatever i don't know <laughs> just gonna throw a number out there eight thousand arrests you know, in 2019, and then uh, with the since the pilot program started, um, you know, now their the rest have gone down 20 percent. You know, were those was was that 20 percent decrease was that all contributed to the effectiveness of the program? I I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to measure that, but I think that that that's at least one um, indicator of how effective a program is um and i'm not sure if, if uh that's helpful to to what was steven was trying to get at but that 
I just thought I'd throw that out there. And then maybe Crystal, because I know you are far more versed than the rest of us, um, that maybe kind of help jog your your mind there right. to speak. Well, well in that. terms of arrests, you, you, you could and, and possibly cannot use that number, right? Because, because arrests mean a, a, a crime was committed, right? And, and, and usually a crisis isn't necessarily a crime. Um, so when we're looking at how programs are effective, what we're looking at is, um, especially with like a 911 dispatch, we're looking at um, how many of those calls were behavioral versus an, an emergency or you know a crime being committed or something like that. Who was able to respond to that? Were we able to, do we, did we have to send officers to a behavioral crisis? Um, versus being able to send Mika to to a, or a, a you know like a mental health provider or a behavioral clinician to to a behavioral call right like that's kind of the thing that you're that that you want to look at the other thing that we're also looking at is the usage of ERs of emergency rooms so so not only is it the nature of calls how many nine one one calls are we getting that are behavioral how many um, how many people are utilizing the ER for behavioral versus medical. Um, the other thing that when you want to look at too is, um, as far as clinics, do the clinics have vacancies? Have have their numbers gone up, right? Like, because and if, if if their numbers have gone up, then that means there's more people who are being able to access mental health services. If it hasn't changed, then either somebody is not getting referred there, or you know, it's it's not something that's valued in the community, something like that. Or maybe they don't have enough staffing. It's like that's kind of the thing with data is like whenever you look at data, you have so many more questions than you had at than than you had at the very beginning. But when we're looking at services and how effective it, it is, it's a systems thing that that you're looking at. Like you can't just look at, you know, how many arrests are 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 there. You know, then we would we would look at how many um how many fifty one fifties were written. You know, how many were children? How many were adult? Um, you know, um. How many times did we have to respond to the school? How many times did they have to send out, um, you know, the police to a school or police to a clinic? Um, so yeah, so like I think when when we're measuring what's the effectiveness, those are kind of the numbers that you probably want to want to look at. It's not just like, oh yeah, you know, out of the out of the thirty thousand people that we've seen, you know, 20,000 20, 20, of them are happy right? Like, that's not just it, because they could be happy. I mean, we try to make sure that they're not in a crisis by the time that we leave leave that crisis, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to come into a crisis again, right? Like, um, how, how many of those are repeated callers? How many of the same people are we seeing on a regular basis? Um, how many of them are linked to services now, and now they haven't been calling 911 because now they have somebody who could help manage and maintain their behavior whether it was you know uh, they got linked to a clinic or or they were able to um you know go into therapy and find out what's some natural support so yeah um, and, and if i may uh yeah. I, you know you know with the numbers here that you're sharing and things that for us to consider to me um uh and it's interesting when you mentioned about the happy uh that could be an indicator i mean that, that's what i'm coming to what right. is our outcome? What do we want to achieve? What do we want the community to, to experience? Is it the number of people call repeat? To me, I know that it, those are activities, right? Mm -hmm. It's what is the experience that we want every single citizen to have, you know, to to uh, that, that we want, right? Is it trust of the police? Is it greater trust? Uh, is it is it happiness? And I think happiness, however that's defined, I think that's a worthwhile metric. In fact, um, I mean, if we get to round to very simple things and all these activities, you know, how many, how little, that can lead to these real core essence of community values, I think those are worthwhile metrics of mm -hmm. objectives of goals not how many or how little uh, yeah i think those are just modalities to get to the a bigger bigger uh, bigger um shared experience yeah so these are, are really great points um back to arnell's point i do think some of our guests in the call with can talk about a little bit of how this has been done so far 
I think the Gardner Center probably does have pretty specific outcomes identified. Um, so when we get to hear from them, that would be great to discuss that as well and see what they've already brought up and see if we have any questions or further suggestions. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely interested in what the Gardner Center had like found out as far as data. And I think, um, you know, when we're looking back as to how to expand this, this pilot program, I think we also have to remember or also like look back at to what were, what were the original goals of this pilot program in the first place. So we could definitely use that information and then, you know, use that to figure out what kind of data we need and, you know, what kind of recommendations we're going to make. Yeah, that's a fair point. I, and I need to do that. <laughs> I, do, I definitely need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, good discussion so far. Is there any, any anything else that anybody wanted to bring up before we hear from Gardner Center is up, right? Yeah. Questions, comments? Cool. OK. All right. And if anybody, if anybody has anything else, just go ahead and let um, email Amy and and and, and Mary Jo. So um, if you don't feel comfortable talking about it now, then go ahead and do that on the back end. Awesome, perfect. Okay, so I think we have the Gardner Center. We got um, Adam Plank and Chief Scott Campbell. Perfect, and I believe Adam Plank. Um, is it Lieutenant or should I say that? I don't know, but I, I believe you're Mika's supervisor, correct? I uh, Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, so okay. um, if it's if it's the right time, then um, if, if I could go um, first with the, uh, the data and then I'll turn it over to uh, James from the Gardner Center. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, uh, nice to see you all again. Um, so this is our uh, presentation uh, regarding the data of the um, pilot program uh, up to um, basically throughout the first year of the uh, of the two year program. And uh, Amy, if you could throw the slide on. Okay, great. So. Um, uh, First slide is just our welcome. Uh, I'll be talking about the data in South San Francisco, and then um, Dr. Uh, James Pine will also uh, be available to discuss uh, the Gardner Center um, and uh, some of the um, interim findings that they've uh, they've made during their first uh, first initial report, and talk about what to expect moving forward. Um, so go ahead to the next slide there. Uh, I just wanted to recap uh, before we started looking at the uh, the numbers, um, so everybody is up to speed. Uh, started in December of 2021, uh, spanning through December of 2023. Um, the uh, clinician uh, Mika works Monday through Friday uh, from nine to five. Um, looking at the uh, the numbers uh, leading into the program, uh, that was the most uh, exposure to the highest volume of calls for us um, with what we looked at. Um, prior to her uh, joining our team. Um, and we have the, uh, the co-response model with the officer and the clinician responding to all uh, calls together. Um, there are certain circumstances uh, where um, Mika feels completely comfortable uh, remaining and doing follow-up or um, her initial uh, contact, uh, whether it be at a, a school or some other um, uh, you know, location where everyone is perfectly fine with her uh, being there on her own and we leave and, and let her do her thing because there's no safety issues. Uh, she responds to these calls, either being dispatched to, um, requested by officers who are already on scene, or if she initiates a contact uh, with someone. And the breakdown there, 75% um, of the time she's dispatched uh, over the radio to respond to a call as it comes in. Uh, about 24% of the time, uh, officers are on scene on an unrelated call and recognize the need um, for Mika's involvement and uh, request her to respond. Uh, and then once she gets there, um, essentially ha uh, hand over the, the, the call to her and uh, and let her do her um, her expertise there. And then on uh, on just 1% of, uh, of the time, she's initiated the call 
uh, maybe a community member calls and has some concerns about a family member or um, some other situation that um, that she learns about it first and then initiates a call and uh, and responds out with the officers. Um, and each of the calls that she goes to um, and uh, the calls that we'll talk about today um, minimally involve uh, at least one follow up with the individual to make sure that uh, uh, there aren't any questions, the referrals uh, made it to the right location um, or any other support that she can offer. So the next slide there. So what uh, what what is what is our um, our five year um, kind of historical perspective on um, fifty one fifty mental health calls look like? Um, in twenty eighteen, uh, there were four hundred total. Uh, twenty nineteen, there was a um, a, a drop to 317, uh, 2020, 406, uh, 2021, 465, and then uh, last year was 397. And ironically, uh, that five-year average um, ends up being 397. Um, so uh, over that five-year period, um, it's the same number that we'll, we'll be talking about uh, in tonight's presentation of the 397. Okay, next slide there. So um, what I wanted to do is, um, you know, we could we could talk about there being 400 calls um, per year, but um, knowing kind of general locations of where they are, I thought might be helpful uh, to the panel. Um, this is a uh, the next five slides are going to be heat maps of the previous years, starting in 2018, um, showing where in South San Francisco we experience uh, these types of calls, um, and then. Um, the, the red or the, uh, the orange colors are higher volume, higher frequency uh, number of calls. So um, I don't know if my cursor um, shows up on your screen. No, it doesn't. Um, so if, if you look, the, uh, the higher, higher concentrated areas uh, fall along the El Camino corridor, El Camino Real, um, the airport boulevard and South Airport Boulevard um, uh, avenues. And then also along Grand Avenue, those are um, the most common, um, highly concentrated areas that you'll see on these five maps. Um, if you go to the next one, we'll look at uh, 2019, and we'll see some similarities. Uh, maybe not the same locations of the green. Uh, the green being everywhere where a call um, in the general area of where a call occurred, but you still see um, some of those orange areas are along Grand um, Airport. Boulevard and the El Camino uh, Real. Uh, the next one is 2020. Um, the, the difference on this slide is uh, up on the uh, kind of upper left corner uh, near El Camino. Um, that, is, uh, that is near the BART station. Um, um, and it, it appears that the, um, the areas that have higher either um, foot traffic, um, public transportation, or other, um, you know, the, the airport strip has uh, the majority of our hotels um, experience more of the uh, the calls resulting in a um, behavioral crisis and results in a uh, 5150 hold uh, with the individual. Um, the next slide, uh, and, and I, I would point out that 2020 was when um, uh, the pandemic started, 2021 is when it was um, kind of going uh, at its strongest and then um, the, the remnants, um, depending on how you look at it, uh, we'll, we'll kind of experience in 2022 when we look at that slide. Uh, you'll see that same red area uh, near the, uh, the BART location. And again, also along South Airport and Grand Avenue and, and El Camino. And the next one um, in 2022 shows, even though the numbers have gone down from the 2021 and 2020, um, annual totals, uh, you'll see there are more noticeable hotspots uh, in those areas that I uh, previously mentioned, um, heavily trafficked areas um, within our city. Um, and moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, so, so this map here uh, shows the four defined districts or beats within South San Francisco that the police department um, staffs and um, essentially breaks calls up by these areas. So um, we have uh, an officer assigned to each of those beats, and then we have uh, 
roving officers or floats that would um, travel throughout the entire city to uh, to respond to calls. And the reason that I um, that I show you this, if if you have a a moment to look at this um, this map, and then Amy, if you could go back to the 2020 slide, you'll kind of see um, how the calls um, kind of break down within each of the different beats. And so if we go back to the um, the next map, uh, what I what I wanted to show you on this one is in in, in the beat one area that essentially covers um, from San Francisco Bay to Orange Park along the Grand Avenue, um, you know, south of Grand Avenue. In 2022, uh, there were 89 cases that resulted in a, a 5150 hold, uh, which accounted for 22% of, uh, of the annual total. Um, in B2, which is the blue area on the left, that covers uh, Brentwood neighborhood, Avalon neighborhood, and uh, Westboro. That, that accounted for 76 cases in 2022, uh, or 19% of all of the calls for the year. Beat three, uh, on the, on the left-hand side of your screen, that is Sunshine Gardens, Burry Burry, uh, Winston Manor, and West Winston Manor neighborhoods. And uh, that, that beat um, actually um, uh, produced the most amount of calls resulting in a 5150 um, outcome at 129 cases or 32% of the annual total. And then um, the, the reddish pink area on the top of your screen is beat four, which is north of Grand Avenue um, from Chestnut Avenue to the Bay. And uh, that uh, accounted for 103 of our uh, annual cases in 2022 or 26% of the, uh, the annual total. Okay, so the next slide, um, what I've done here is I've broken down um, that 397 annual total by month. Uh, you'll see that January and February were the highest of the, uh, of the year. Um, I, I don't have um, specific reasons as to why some months are lower, some months are higher. There is, um, you know, you can, you can speculate um, after, after winter break, uh, that might have been when school resu resumed to uh, back in person, as opposed to being um, in a distance or, or some kind of hybrid distance. It's also the first two full months of the pilot program. Uh, she started um, the second, uh, actually responding to calls the first or second week of December. And then with the holidays, I consider January and February the first two um, full months of, uh, of operation. And um, from, from those two months onto the rest of the year, um, we, we averaged um, you know, between 25 and 35 cases per month um, for, the, for the remainder of the year. Um, on, the next, on the next slide, Amy, um, this is also a breakdown of the monthly totals um, for the year. However, uh, the orange bar shows um, per month how many times the officers responded to um, and handled the 5150s uh, because they were after hours uh, or uh, Miko was unavailable. And the blue um, represents which calls Miko was the primary point of contact um, on these calls that resulted in a, a 5150 um, uh, hold and transport to a hospital. Um, if you total the entire um, clinician uh, columns together, you get a total of 80 which accounts for 20% of the annual total. Um, clinician uh, Chelly was the primary point of contact and handled um, during, during the co-response. She, she was there, um, completed the forms and, um, and handled those calls. On the next slide, uh, like I said, uh, Mika works Monday through Friday. Uh, this is a breakdown of those 397 uh, calls per day. And you can see with the exception of Thursday, they're all fairly consistent uh, among each other um, with the later half of the week, um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday being, um, you know, between, between three, two, between two and six 
higher than uh, the earlier days in the week. Um, overall, uh, the numbers are, are fairly consistent throughout the week. Um, I don't know if, if these would indicate to us uh, a strong need to change her schedule uh, to, to reach um, you know, the few extra that are on the weekend. Um, however, um, you know, we, we did know that in the beginning, um, starting the schedule between you know, uh, nine to five, Monday through Friday, might be something that needs to be changed and looked at maybe uh, at the end of the two years. Um, on the uh, on the next slide, we have the calls broken down uh, on the time of day that that we received them and responded. Um, you'll you'll see, and and it, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. The majority of the calls happen between nine a.m. and nine p.m. Um, the seventy nine, eighty, and seventy nine all happened. Uh, during somewhat, you know, what's considered normal hours of when people are awake at school, at work, um, going about their um, their daily activities, you'll see a um, a slight drop between nine and one uh, nine p.m. and one a.m. and then a fairly significant drop uh, between the one a.m. and five a.m. and uh, even further between five a.m. and nine a.m. Um, Stephen, did you have a question that I could answer about? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, sure. Yeah, and thanks for walking us through the data. Uh, and I was just curious, you know how this one in particular, the time calls, you get these brackets, these little like uh, three hour time blocks. Yes. Right? Uh, is, is it corresponding to like like a nine to five business day? I mean, how how is that defined? I was just curious. Or determined um, blocks. So in the interest of, um, uh, I guess, clarity on, on viewing the data, um, if I had broken it down by hour, um, there would have been there would have been so many bars and um, and, and information on the chart that might have been um, hard to hard to um, kind of digest. Um, I did it in blocks, um, starting at 9 a.m. when Mika starts, and then ending at 5 p.m. when she's done, and then can just continue it throughout the day as well. Um, because um, if we if we maintained that Monday through Friday or that five days a week, um, eight hours a day schedule um i think it would be worthwhile to know kind of um if it's if it's worth keeping uh, 9 to 5 or something that that may be more beneficial you know a um a, a 1 to 9 p.m. um type of setup or yeah yeah thank, thank you. you okay um on the next slide and um for many of the slides uh, moving forward um we're going to break down um some of the information regarding uh, the involved indiv individuals um, associated to those 5150 um, cases. Uh, we found that the most frequent age of, uh, of individuals um, happened between 18 and 39. So the two, uh, the two columns in the middle of the 89 and 87 total. Um, that age group accounted for 44% of uh, all the cases uh, where a subject required a medical evaluation. Um, the other categories, um, consisted of 34 cases for under 18. And, um, and I did notice that one month in particular had a high volume of under 18. Um, and, um, and it was kind of a abnormal uh, month and then everything else kind of leveled and, and maintained at around the same level for the other, um, the other months of the year. So I'm not sure, sure if that was a, an outlier month that, uh, that swayed those numbers or not. Um, 66 were between 40 and 49, uh, 55 were between 50 and 59, and 63 were over the age of 59. Um, and, and, and this will give me a, 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 a good time to uh, just mention that um, there were some certain individuals who were involved in these calls um, that, uh, that generated re repeated responses um, not from from officers uh, and if Miko was available, um, the co-response um, throughout the year. In fact, um, uh, one one individual had um, had thirty four contacts throughout the year um, with the police department, and six of those resulted in a uh, uh, her being transported to the hospital on a fifty one fifty hold. And, you know, the, looking at these numbers, they're not that high um, when you think about it. And six 
could significantly impact um, the uh, the data on that bar and easily, you know, make it surpass and become become the highest age group based on that person's um, six repeated um, calls. Uh, there was also uh, another individual who had um, several contacts with the police department and uh, a total of 10 5150 holds during the, the 2022 uh, year, um, most of which, if not all, were um, self-reports where the subject had called and, and asked for assistance for himself um, because of the, uh, the crisis that he was having. And so those numbers, um, not only on this slide, but on some of the future slides are gonna impact the, uh, the annual totals. And it looks like I have a couple of questions. I'll pause here and, uh, and see if I can answer those. Okay, Crystal. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm curious as to the the under 18. Um, what what month was that, Lieutenant? I believe it was. If you give me one second, I should be able to tell you. I, I, I'm, I'm curious if it was that September October after that event at South City High. I'm just really curious. Oh no, um, it was not. It was. Uh, we had a, a high number in March. March. Yes. Interesting. Okay. That's good to know. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was March. Okay. okay. And uh, Stephen. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Uh, sure. just, let me just kind of blitz them real quick. So actually, you, you shared something I, I, very helpful, you, like how a single person can have multiple calls. I get that. So this particular slide with the graph showing, is this speaking to the number of unique individuals or uh, based upon the number of times from individuals? Uh, this one, this this slide does not differentiate um, multiple um, 5150 uh, transports uh, involving the same individual. So it, it, it just encompasses the total um, number of calls for the year in those age ranges. Okay, of which, like you shared earlier, some of this could be multiples coming from the same. Uh, exactly, uh, yes. Exactly. Okay. So, okay. So the two examples that I gave, one was between 40 and 49 category, yeah. and the other was over 59. Okay. Yes. Great, thank you. And my second uh, quick question is in regards to the other uh, the other end of the spectrum, uh, those over 59. Um, it, and maybe in two parts, help remind me, uh, do you do you have uh, do you have kind of like a like like um, insights in terms of these de age demographic groups about unique type of cases uh, that's distinctive for each age group? Um, and secondly, uh, maybe for the over uh, 59, maybe compared to other years, do you see that changing with the aging population? That was good questions. Um, I did not differentiate for the purpose of this uh, presentation, um, the, the differences of the type of um, uh, need for the, um, for the transport. I, I can tell you that, um, you know, during my, uh, my years here at the police department, um, the over 59 population um, more frequently is involved in the, um, so the criteria is a danger to themselves, uh, a danger to others, or gravely disabled, unable to care for themselves. Um, over 59 falls into the category of uh, unable to care for themselves, gravely disabled, um, being uh, someone, a neighbor, a family member, uh, a friend, um, calls us and asks us to do a welfare check. And when we get there, uh, living conditions are not, um, are, are not safe. Um, there's no access to food. Sometimes there's no uh, power or um, or other necessities that are needed. And um, for their own safety, um, we we do the temporary placement so they can um, start the access process with uh, with other services to uh, to remedy those problems. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. On our next slide. So our next slide. Um, documents the uh, the race or ethnicity of uh, those involved individuals. Um, you'll see that uh, of the 397 cases um, transported to a medical facility, 34% uh, were white, 
32% uh, were Hispanic, 13% were Black, 12% were Asian, and 7% were classified as other or um, uh, either didn't identify or, um, or, or, or fell into a category that wasn't represented of those four uh, main categories. Yes, Stephen. Uh, this, uh, it, you may or may not know, uh, we have a data subcommittee. We touched base last Friday. Uh, and this one uh, kind of surprised us quite a bit. Uh, your thoughts, because with the number of uh, Caucasian whites, that's proportionally pretty, seems to be very significant. Um, any commentaries uh, regarding, you know, at least between the, uh, with the whites, the numbers? Well, I can um, I can tell you that the the comparison of uh, the the data on this chart um, is not consistent with um, our census totals or the inf information on um, the demographics for South San Francisco. Um, the uh, data from from the the census, uh, I don't know if uh, you know relying on um, on participation. Um, and, and the other charts that I've I've looked at when I reviewed this information, uh, the population of uh, white residents was 22 percent. So uh, there's that ends up being um, 12 percent higher um, on the information that we're seeing here uh, on this category for for 2022. Um, uh, and none of them were accurately um accurate represented uh, based on our city's demographics, um, based on these numbers. I will tell you that um, the two examples that I gave you earlier about the, uh, the repeated uh, calls involving the same person, um, one of those examples uh, was in the, um, the white category, and one of the examples was in the black category. So uh, those numbers were uh, inflated by, by those two individuals, um, not um, not exaggeratedly uh, uh, impacted, but they 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 made the the two columns higher um, from uh, from those two individuals. Um, and you know there there are other categories that are lower um, than our city demographics, uh, like the um, the Asian population uh, being twelve percent on this chart of uh, impacted um, individuals and um, the information that uh, that I found to be most accurate uh, involved a 43% uh, population, um, whereas it's 12% uh, of those uh, involved in the 5150 uh, transport. So um, uh, yes, definitely noticeable. However, I'm not sure uh, what contributes to the, uh, the inconsistent percentages, if, if that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one more question, um, Arnell. Captain Plank, how are you? Hello. Uh, I have a question, it's regarding that chart. Are, are these um, persons who identify themselves as white or is this the police officer, you know, marking it? Marking, uh, you know, marking it themselves, and 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 they're identifying, uh, to the best of their knowledge, the ethnicity of the person they've detained. So I would say that um, it would be the police officers writing the report, um, filling out the 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 required paperwork and writing the police report, unless. You know, there, there's a couple different ways that they could obtain that information. Um, filling out uh, a contact card um, asks for uh, information uh, to include um, the the person's race. Um, so as we go through the card, um, if it's uh, if it's something that requires uh, a question, um, then we'll ask that and confirm it. Um, if uh, if if it's not, then um, I would assume that the officers would be um, completing that based on their observations and and own own experience uh, being out on the call. Okay, thank you, Captain 
fine. That makes sense. Okay, you're welcome. Um, on the uh, on the next page, let me thank you. Uh, so the breakdown of uh, those involved uh, and their gender, 57% um, were male and 43% uh, were female. I'm not sure why the percentage didn't show up on the, um, on the chart. Um, again, uh, the, the data that I found for South San Francisco shows, uh, shows more of a 50-50 a um, uh, kind of a difference between, um, between uh, those, those genders. Uh, I'm not sure of the... The, dis the discrepancy and what the cause is um, for uh, for for two, uh, 2022 and uh, what we're viewing today. Okay, and on the next slide, um, we talk about the housing status of those uh, those individuals. The unhoused population accounted for 27 percent of, uh, of of our all cases, and the remaining 73 percent involved those with stable housing. Our next slide. Um, our next slide covers uh, the city of residence of those who are involved in these calls. Um, the majority of the individuals in these cases were residents of South San Francisco, um, accounting for 59% of uh, all the incidents. Um, the second highest, as you'll see um, on the chart there, were those that reside outside of South San Francisco, whether it be um, in San Francisco, uh, in other uh, greater Bay Area, cities or um, since we're at the airport and we have uh, quite a few hotels, um, we get out of state and uh, and and occasionally out of country um, uh, people who are uh, in need of um, mental health assistance. And then the uh, the remaining, I think it was um, it was fairly low percentage. You'll see the top from uh, San Bruno up to the top of your screen. Those are the other cities um, that had a resident. Uh, who experienced a uh, behavioral health crisis uh, during 2022 uh, within San Mateo County. Stephen. Yeah, uh, and thank you for this one. I'm just curious when you identify non-South City residents, right? What type of coordination collaboration of sorts uh, uh, to refer them or connect with the other cities from where they're, you know, they're residing on, you know, regarding their services? What, what kind of, yeah, coordination understanding is network is, is in play? So um, the, the coordination um, would fall uh, when they're at um, the psychiatric emergency services. Um, and uh, I, uh, I don't have the exact answer on, on what takes place there. I do know that um, in instances with um, like child protective services uh, or child and family services or adult protective services, when they are um, in our um, medical system, our hospitals here, uh, they establish jurisdiction fairly quickly. And I believe that they make those, they have social workers that come in and make those uh, referrals, if not um, gather information and, um, and send the information to the other counties uh, where they reside uh, as part of their um, normal course of duty. Um, we get referrals um, from from those other um, those other agencies like CFS and, and APS, um, when when children or um, or elderly adults um, live in our city and uh, experience some kind of um, an event that uh, that would require follow up on our end or an investigation uh, fairly quickly, and uh, I would assume that that same process happens uh, in the mental health system. Yeah. Yes, Crystal. No, I just kind of wanted to help like answer Stephen's question. That's actually more of a question for behavioral health recovery services as far as like when they do get discharged from from a hospital that, and what that hospital discharge planner does. Do they refer them back to the insurance? Do they refer them back to county services? It's it's it, it's definitely a difficult question, but it, it's definitely more of a question for um, behavioral health services, behavioral health recovery services, if you're wanting that exact data they would have it. Right. Thank you. So uh, we briefly um, uh, talked about this during the end, uh, at the end of the last um, presentation uh, prior to me, but on the next slide, um, 
we uh, were able to um, collect data on um, how many of, of these behavioral health crisis calls had uh, associated criminal charges or at least a, a, a crime that occurred um, during that same investigation, whether it happened prior to the um, individual uh, meeting the criteria for a, uh, for a mental health hold, or if it was after um, the person was, uh, was placed under arrest for a, uh, a criminal violation that the behavioral crisis um, occurred. So as you can see, there were a total of 40 cases that involved a crime, um, which amounted to 10% of the um, 397 calls for 2022. Um, in January, saw the highest number. Um, if, if you think back to our first slide, uh, when the monthly totals, uh, January was the highest total um, for the number of calls there as well. But we saw a, a significant drop from uh, January um, to, you know, essentially, um, with the exception of October, um, three and under uh, per month where uh, the person who was uh, having a behavioral, behavioral health crisis um, was, uh, was also involved in some type of uh, a criminal activity. Um, now for clarification, this would include when a person uh, experiences a uh, behavioral health crisis and commits a crime prior to uh, us going and establishing that they meet the criteria for a, um, a 5150 hold. So they have either um, stolen, um, committed a theft, a, an assault, a robbery, something of that, um, similar to that. And then when we contact them, um, we establish that they're having some type of crisis. And um, the other way that this this type of um, uh, connection between uh, the, the two elements here happens is if someone is placed under arrest for let's say domestic violence or some other type of crime, and um, during that um, during that process, become uh, involved in some type of behavioral health crisis, they're they're going to be leaving uh, their environment um, because of the charges, and then they make suicidal comments to the officers uh, or start behaving in a way that um, prompts them to be transported to the to the hospital for treatment, uh, as opposed to being um, uh, booked at the jail. For uh, for the for the offense, I would say that the majority um, of these, unless it's a very serious um, um, crime against uh, like crime against a, a person as opposed to a, a property crime, the majority of these um, individuals are are transported to the hospital and the cases uh, written and referred to the court system for review of prosecution um, at a later time, as opposed to. Um, uh, being booked at the uh, at the facility at the jail uh, for the crimes and um, somehow impeding or uh, slowing you know slowing down the process of getting the mental help that they need. Now, Crystal, did you have a question on this slide, or is your hand still up from the other one? No, I'm sorry, I forgot to lower it. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure. Okay, and uh, the next slide. So the next slide uh, involves um, the, the frequency of when uh, officers uh, were required to use force uh, involving uh, these incidents. Um, the 398 incidents in 2022, 2% um, 2 of those, or a total of eight, involved some type of a use of force uh, involved to safely detain, uh, get, get someone uh, to the transportation uh, vehicle, or overcome a resistance uh, that was provided uh, by the individual. Um, 5150 hold um, involving a person, um, I, I think everyone is aware, but it's, it's an involuntary um, process that, where the person who um, meets the criteria does not always want to go. And sometimes um, it's required for officers to help escort them to um, the fire department when, when they arrive to, uh, to transport or the ambulance. Um, and sometimes we place them uh, briefly in handcuffs to prevent them from, um, you know, inflicting additional uh, self-harm to themselves until they could um, safely talk to someone uh, about the uh, behavioral health uh, crisis that they're having. Um, and moving on to the next slide. So 
kind of a summary. Um, Mika, uh, our, our clinician here in South San Francisco, has responded to a total of 278 incidents, um, either that she's been dispatched to, uh, officers requested her to uh, respond to, or that she initiated. And um, like I said, she does attempt follow-ups with um, as many individuals as she can uh, with limitations of uh, working telephones and um, physical addresses that she can um, that she can actually make that contact with. Um, there were uh, an additional 320 incidents that uh, were reported to the police department that occurred during Mika's off hours. Uh, so beyond the nine to five, uh, we had another 320 additional incidents. Um, that the 278 and the 320 did not obviously result in a 5150 mental health um, transport to a, a facility, but they were uh, mental health related calls for service uh, that she could have been a part of um, had she been working. Um, and then there was an, an additional 29 incidents uh, that were reported during her scheduled work hours, but because of uh, her being on uh, another call for service or uh, if she was in a, a mandatory meeting or something that kept her from going, um, she was not able to uh, connect on those. Um, Mika has also provided um, uh, both formal and informal trainings to um, our patrol teams uh, and other members of the police department. Um, items like uh, how, to, how to properly complete 5150 um, evaluation forms. Uh, so when the form accompanies the person to the hospital, the most effective um, uh, result for the person um, and, the, and the viewers who are reading those documents uh, when, when that person arrives. Um, she's also been asked um, not only by officers, uh, but by um, by groups outside the police department to provide support. Um, like, uh, like Crystal had said, um, one of the schools had uh, requested her uh, to respond and um, and meet with a, a group of um, uh, of people associated to the school uh, to offer them uh, support and uh, and talk to them after a critical incident. Um, she's also um, responded to calls at the officer's request or uh, or, or um, supervisor's requests when there are critical incidents, uh, death of a family member. Um, she responded to provide assistance to families uh, when one of their um, loved ones uh, committed suicide. Um, and, and she goes and initiates the process. They may not be having a behavioral health crisis at the moment, uh, but she has gone and offered um, resources and, and, and support and um, her expertise on those to, to help that process uh, go as smoothly as possible and prevent something from coming up in the future. And uh, on the next slide, um, what I'd like to point out here is uh, what we found is the most, uh, most frequent call that Mika responds to it involves a welfare check. Um, welfare checks um, uh, can include um, any and everything um, involved in the, under the sun. Uh, it could be someone who is um, sitting at a bus stop uh, throwing rocks at a, at a street sign. It could be someone who is, um, uh, you know, a neighbor, a friend, a family member calls and because they can't get in touch with um, this person and, uh, and we respond, uh, Mika responds with us and um, welfare checks are the number one call that she responds to um, by a, a pretty large percentage. Uh, the second most frequent call that she responds to is um, a report of a, an active, um, actively occurring behavioral health crisis where someone is um, inflicting self-harm, threatening to uh, inflict self-harm, or, um, or doing something that would in, you know, uh, imminently endanger someone else uh, based on their actions. Um, the, third, uh, the third item on this list is, uh, is essentially all the other calls that uh, that that take place, um, one, you know, uh, very low percentages, but this miscellaneous group of calls um, that uh, that generate, you know, it, it could be something that sounds like it's going to be um, this type of call, and when the officers get there, it turns into something else uh, very quickly uh, based on the uh, the people involved and the circumstances, and then Mika's response is requested. Um, disturbances are number four. Um, that could that could involve uh, disturbances at stores, within families, um, uh, just in, in in neighborhoods, neighbor disturbances, um, suspicious persons and vehicles is number five. Um, 
requests to assist the fire department when they go out on medical calls is number six. Um, trespassing is uh, the number seventh uh, highest volume of calls that she responds to. Eight is juvenile cases. Nine is court order, court order violations, and ten is uh, physical assaults. And uh, on the last slide, the top actions taken by Mika um, besides uh, the follow-ups that she tries to do on every single call is uh, provide emotional support uh, to the people involved. She does that uh, almost every single call, unless it's um, a call that sounded like she was needed and it ended up being completely unrelated and, um, and, and not connected to a, a behavioral health crisis at all. Um, she's offering uh, emotional support. Number two is provided resources to the in individual. Number three is to conduct an evaluation uh, if the person meets the criteria for a 5150 um, hold. Number four is to um, do the evaluation and actually determine that the person meets the criteria and transports to a hospital. Number five is to establish a safety plan. Uh, if the person doesn't meet the criteria, um, if, if there's just not enough um, to warrant some other type of action um, from Mika, she, um, she will develop a safety plan with the family members involved uh, on what, what to do and how to keep the situation safe uh, if that were to occur again in the future. Um, number six is the, the person declined any services, um, was offered um, services, was, um, you know, attempts were made to, uh, to connect with this person and they refused all, all services. And number seven, and uh, the least frequent activity is uh, being referred to an outside agency. Um, and, and, and that one is, um, I believe seldom, seldomly used, uh, that would be if, if she were to go, uh, recognize that it wasn't a, um, wasn't a, a, a behavioral health specific type of call, but, um, she recognized the need for, um, child and family services or adult protective services, uh, to become involved. And she referred with her County, um, contacts and, and other, um, other information, uh, the best route for uh, for those involved to uh, to take. Um, so that's my last slide. Uh, com concludes the presentation on the data uh, for the first year of our uh, of our uh, CWCRT program. Um, I can answer any questions that uh, that we may have at the end um, before introducing uh, doc Dr. James Pine. Who uh, thank you for being here, James. Uh, he's going to give a brief overview of how the uh, John Gardner Center uh, at Stanford University. Uh, is uh, assisting uh, us and the other three cities with uh, collecting data, um, what um, what that analysis uh, might look like, and 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 maybe some information from that uh, that initial report that uh, that came out. Thank you. Okay, are we going to go right into my part, or are there more questions? How I defer to the uh, commission. I think in, in terms of a uh, time, it might be good if we just kind of dive into yours. If you okay. don't mind, then we could hold off for questions later. That'd be great. Cool. Uh, okay, so I am James Pine. I'm a senior research associate at Stanford's Gardner Center. And uh, I mainly specialize in quantitative research, including uh, experimental and quasi-experimental research. Uh, Dr. Kristen Geiser is also on the program. Or, or sorry, on, on the project and is, unfortunately could not be here. She is leading our qualitative research efforts uh, and I will do my best to do justice to uh, that aspect of the research. So uh, Adam alluded to uh, an interim report that we put out in, last March that was covering the first six months of the pilot program. And I think I want I would like to start there as we and then we'll then I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we're hoping to do moving forward. So that first interim report actually had a lot of ground to cover because part of what we're doing is looking at the implementation of the pilot programs in the four cities, but then and then also looking at the outcomes once we understand the context better. So. The interim report was not only covering the first six months of the pilot, but the entire year leading up to that, that had this uh, very uh, 
I, I would say a strong and unique collaboration between the four cities and the county. And we want, really wanted to make sure that we were capturing exactly how that was being developed uh, in that first year of planning. And uh, some of you might recall that, that it was a year of planning in part because there, was, there were some issues with uh, recruiting clinicians. Like we heard earlier in the previous presentation, it, it's difficult everywhere to hire clinicians in these types of uh, roles. So the first step in our research and in developing this, uh, this implementation study is in creating a theory of change. Some of you talked about like remembering what, it, what were the initial uh, motivations and goals for the program. That's what the theory of change is meant to capture. And Dr. Chris, Chris and Geyser developed this and is included in our interim report. But just to give you a quick overview, the theory of change starts with a problem statement. It uh, identifies core program elements. In this case, case it would be dispatch of clinicians, co-response of clinicians and police officers, this continuum of care, making sure that people get to the right places and into the right systems, and then professional development for everybody involved. So those are the core program elements that the theory of change has identified. The next part of the theory of change is talking about short-term outcomes. And so I can talk a little bit more about kind of the full range of things that we're interested in, but mostly mo for the most part, this is all coming from uh, police administrative records for our purposes. Uh, we're interested in reduced rates of arrest, 5150 holds, uh, and uh, like, uh, and to some degree, use of force uh, incidents, but also uh, thinking more qualitatively about improved cross-sector collaboration and and how uh, different stakeholders and partners are interpreting the program. And so then finally, the theory of change has long-term outcomes, and that's related to rates of involvement in the of uh, those involved with uh, the co-response program in criminal justice system and the healthcare system. And so uh, we, can, we can talk a little bit more about that, but all that stuff is in the interim report. So our data collection uh, is, is, is ongoing. It's a two-year program. And of course, we have, to, we have to let the program do its work. That includes implementation and outcomes. But uh, in the in this interim in our interim report that we presented in March, we talked about our data collection of interviews, observations, and documents that have been developed by program partners. We're collecting incident level police agency administrative data from January 2019, which is well before the program began, all the way through the end of the pilot program in the coming years. The interim report only. Re only reports on descriptive uh, incident level data up to June 22 at that point. Cause you know, we, like part of what we have to do is get the data from all the different agencies, kind of help it all agree and then kind of uh, 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 report it back to our partners. And that was the main goal of that main room report. So some of the emerging themes, if I can just say them very quickly, the, uh, they're, they're very consistent with what uh, Adam mentioned in South San Francisco. There are consistencies across the different cities. There are some differences. Uh, so in the first seven months, there were a total of 1,600 reported requests by dispatchers for clinicians across the four cities. And of those 1,600, there were 500 responses by clinicians. And these are reported requests and reported responses. And I'll get to that in a minute uh, for our work moving forward. Uh, I, the preliminary descriptive evidence that we, that we saw suggests that 5150 hold write-ups had declined since the program began. And we talk about that briefly in the interim report, and we don't want to uh, overstate those patterns. These are very early patterns. It's the first six or seven months of the program, but we want to keep our eye on those kinds of things. And some of the things that we've been uh, looking into since releasing that interim report 
uh, have uh, been informed by some of those potential trends. And we can talk, I can, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. And uh, another thing that we find as an emerging theme is that follow-up is crucial and clinicians uh, are consistently appearing to follow up with served individuals. So that becomes this, uh, uh, you know, there's this initial contact and then like usually having at least one, potentially several follow-ups with people is like a part of the program that really adds on to the uh, response to mental health services that sometimes the uh, police agencies can't necessarily do because you've got to move on to the next call. So follow-up is, uh, is almost never uh, an option. Clinicians are able to follow up and we're finding that that is uh, consistent across the four cities. So the next steps, uh, we have an, another, we are working on the next interim report. And I'm sorry, I just realized I said it was in March. It was in September that we released the uh, last interim report. So apologies. The next one is going to be released, released in March 2023 to our partners. And so that's coming up next month. So learning from some of the implementation uh, of the early program, we're going to focus on uh, the dispatch sense making and decision making uh, as the as the focal point of this March 2023 interim report, and that's because right now we're reporting on the report the, the requests that we see in the data for a clinician, and while we do have reason to believe that the responses of clinicians are accurate we wanna get an idea of what's happening with dispatch when they know that a clinician isn't on duty or what uh, officers in the field are doing when they know a clinician isn't on duty. So it, it, some of this is research related. So it's like ticking a box when you know you don't need to. Um, and so, But some of it is also implementation because uh, one, well, not to get too much into this uh, next report, but just thinking about uh, that uh, initial contact and the follow-up and what clinicians can do as follow-up, maybe if they are not even part of the initial contact. So that's going to be a, uh, something that's developing right now. I can't say a lot more about it at this point, but hopefully we will have some more information next month. We After that, we'll have a third interim report in September 2023, and then, a, and then we'll have a final report in early 2024. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that that is the that that is basically the extent of where we are right now. I'm happy to talk about uh, some of the outcomes we hope to uh, be able to talk about once we have more data and we let the program do its work. Um, and I'm happy to talk about some of the other work that I've done in uh, uh, trying to find some credibly ca causal evidence for these alternative response programs. So uh, thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Um, questions. Thank you also, Captain Plank, for your, your in-depth presentation as well. We really appreciate that. And you guys are doing really good work over there. So um, appreciate that. Yeah, any questions so far? Yeah, just real quick, uh, Christopher May and and James, thanks for the snapshot. I mean, that was that was a, a you know rich kind of perspective snapshot. Um, so, are you saying that at this point, because of the small you, you know the sample size, is not quite significant yet? So, you're saying statistic, statistically not significant yet to make any meaningful uh, kind of commentaries? Is that fair to say? Um, I would say it's it goes a little beyond statistical significance. It, it is true that the clinicians. Uh, there haven't been a lot of calls, but it also is, is this is a pilot program, right? And so things are ramping up and things might change over time. And so, I mean, and not like now that a year has passed, uh, we, we could say like maybe thing, we've worked the bugs out. Some of the implementation work that we're doing is speaking to that, but some of it is just saying like, how is the program developing over time? What are, what are we learning and how, uh, how does that how does that influence the trends that we're seeing? So uh, so I I would say like you could talk about statistical power a little bit. That's true with especially with some of the work that I'm doing, but uh, using police administrative data. But again, some of it's just kind of letting it 
do its work and letting it evolve and understanding the contexts. Yeah. And oh, and, and one more com and one more thing, more of a commentary. I appreciate your your commentary about essentially the decision making triage, that workflow, you know, that that process. So um, I'm glad you're paying attention to that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Stephen. Anybody else so far? Mm. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Okay. Well, I think, you know, we definitely have like a lot to discuss as well. Um, but I do, I guess I do have a question for um, Captain Plank. So, when you showed us the slide on the 5150s and, and it seemed like significantly there was, you know, as, as far as um, the ethnicities who were being put on a hold, um, Hispanic was a huge number. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of like translation services or, or anything like that, you know, do you guys send officers um, who might be able to explain like what, what's happening to them a little bit more. I, I guess that's just a question that I have ab about that, just considering the, um, you know, the different ethnicities that came up. How are we, uh, as a city, making sure that we have people who can help um, translate or, you know, in in somebody's native tongue, explain what's happening to them when they're being put on a hold? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, we have um, we have a variety of um, officers who speak uh, many many different languages. Um, they uh, they may be working um, the the area of town uh, on the opposite side of South San Francisco, but when a call comes out and translation is needed, uh, they respond and uh, they are the ones who um, who translate, uh, make sure that uh, the, the the people who are involved, whether it's uh, behavioral health. Call or uh, it's a um, uh, a non criminal call where someone's asking for help or support, and, or if it's something that's crime related, uh, they are the main point of contact uh, on those calls. If we don't have an officer who is working, uh, we also have um, uh, police service technicians, parking enforcement officers um, uh, on our staff who can translate uh, what the officers are saying. Um, or, or what Mika is saying to uh, to the individuals, and um, and because there's so many other um, police departments nearby um, who have uh, other resources, uh, sometimes beyond uh, what we have, um, it's not uncommon for us to call San Bruno, uh, Pacifica, Daly City, or Coma, and have them respond to calls and uh, and help us with translation. Um, one of the things that uh, that Mika has had from the beginning of this pilot program is a iPad and a language line um, translation service uh, that actually will translate via FaceTime uh, with anyone that she needs to with a simple um, call on the iPad that she has uh, issued just to her. Uh, so she, and it covers, um, uh, I, I believe, every language available uh, to include sign language. Um, so I don't know that we've ever had a situation where we weren't able to communicate uh, with the person effectively, uh, either as uh, someone from our staff or someone from uh, a neighboring agency or that language line. Cool, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Captain Pike. That's a, that's amazing. That's awesome. Um, I think an another question that I had was I know that the data we were looking at said you know that these were um, the, the the data of individuals who were. I believe put on a 5150. Do we have any data available where it, it was a behavioral call but didn't result in a 5150, right? So meaning that, you know, that crisis intervention, crisis de-escalation is basically all that that needed and it actually didn't need for a 5150. Do you know if if you guys have been tracking that or not or if there's a way to track that? Yes, so um, so we have uh, started tracking that. I did not have the uh, uh, the data, I believe, for the entire year of 2022 um, uh, broken down. However, um, essentially, every call that um, that that Mika responds to now, um, in order to accurately 
capture the, the information that we're, we're trying to, to grab here in, in South San Francisco. She completes a um, uh, essentially an application on her phone that covers um, uh, incident number, time, um, hmm. uh, location, um, the outcome, uh, what type of call it was, and then some of the uh, demographics of the uh, the individual that's involved. Um, and not all of those are uh, resulting in a 5150 hold itself. Um, right. But we are gathering that and able to um, to filter through it um, a, a lot more um, efficiently uh, than going through. Uh, like I mentioned, there's 276 that she had gone to last year, um, yeah. and then you add all the other ones that uh, that we received through the police department, um, going through and, and grabbing all of that for uh, each individual call. Um, we streamlined it with this application. Oh, right on. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Captain Plank. Appreciate that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. You guys are doing great work over there. It's kind of cool, and I especially really like. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious just about this. I know I have so many questions, but I know you know when when we had done a tour of of, of the new police station, which is amazing and beautiful, and I'm I'm glad you guys have that. I, I noticed that you guys have an application specifically for for your for law enforcement for for their own mental health, and I was just wondering like. If, if you guys have Mika also doing, you know, trainings for, for officers who might need some kind of, you know, like uh, psychoeducation or anything like that, even just for the officers, making sure that you guys could use Mika as well for that. Yeah, at this point, um, we, we have not um, utilized her as a resource uh, in that category. Um, uh, we, we do have resources available to officers, um, uh, both. Um, in person, um, you know, over over the app that you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. and um, the the um, the fact that she responds with and works with uh, officers, she's established really good relationships with um, with I would I would argue everyone uh, here uh, uh, at on, on all shifts, and so yeah. um, she 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 may be doing some of that uh, informally, uh, but uh, but nothing formal. Uh, and nothing, um, you know, structured at this point. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else have any other questions? All right. I think, I think that's all. If, if, if there's anything else, I'm, I'm sure that we can reach out to Captain Plank and to, and to James again in the future. So, um, cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I, I, I appreciate you guys doing that and presenting uh, all the data and information that you guys have presented to us. So, Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. It was very, it's a pleasure. Thank you, James. <laughs> all right. So I think we can, Amy, we can move forward, right? Or Yeah, the next thing on the agenda was a discussion of the presentation. Yeah. So yeah, we could we could start that. We can definitely give a few minutes to that. I know it's starting to get a little late, but um, yeah, we could probably like take five, five minutes to do that. I'll just know in case people are wondering. Um, Arnell's phone died, and he's without power due to the storm, and um, Stephen had to leave early for another reason. Yeah, my my power went out for my laptop too, so I'm on my phone now. So. Yeah, definitely be safe out there with all that wind. Get your generators out. Oh. Any, anybody want to start a discussion, question, comments? I think um, right, 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 right off the top of my head, I think if we do move to hiring like a second clinician, maybe that second clinician could have a language capability preferably Spanish. It seems like that's like a big, um, big, big population that, that does utilize that. Um, that was kind of like the first thing that I thought of. Um, but also I'm really interested to, to know like how many of those did not result in a 5150. And I think, you know, that would have been good for um, Stephen to know, because that is a really important number to know that there you go. Like, this is how you could directly answer it's working, you know, out of 
you know, let's say like 600 calls, only behavior calls, maybe like only 100 of these resulted in a 5150 and 500 of these were, you know, they were able to deescalate or, um, you know, get them transferred to somebody else um, that needed like a lower level of care. So I think that's like good information to know. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments? All right. Um, all right, let's go to the next item then, Amy. Okay, next we had updates from staff. Just wanted to fill you all in on a few things. Um, so the state Brown Act regulations around ha having public meetings, I think are changing, um, you know, due to the pandemic meetings were virtual, but now meetings will be going back in person. So I believe our next meeting in March, the third Monday of March will likely be in person, probably at city hall in the conference room where Sal is calling in from now. Um, so. <laughs> So we'll all get to meet together. I think it's gonna be really uh, enjoyable to have everyone in the same room. And I'll send out an email for people not on the call here, but we'll be going back in person. Um, the equity inclusion officer position is interviewing. So I'm guessing they're gonna come on in April, maybe in March or maybe April. Um, also thinking about hosting the retreat in April once they're on board. You all had mentioned you, you preferred a weekend for a few hours. So we'll try and schedule that. Um, you might have seen my email. I just heard from Cahoots uh, yesterday, I believe. Um, they are the mobile crisis team in Eugene, Oregon, that became a national model as people all over the country were looking into alternative response to mental health phone calls. So Cahoots is like, I guess the gold standard, they've been operating a really long time and a lot of people have looked to their model. So they're holding info sessions coming up that anyone can attend and ask questions. The first one's on Thursday from uh, I think 9 to 10.30 a.m. So uh, if you're interested, please sign up to visit one or more of those sessions and bring what you learned back here. I'm gonna try and attend as well, but I can't go to the full meeting. Um, so if you're interested, that stuff on Cahoots is out there. You can go participate, learn about their program and bring what you learn back here. Um, and lastly, um, we talked about going back over information in some of the previous presentations and, um, I discussed with the chair and vice chair, maybe doing viewing parties and going back over some of the presentations we've seen. Um, especially with like the questions on our new survey thing to kind of review and recap what we've learned um, probably in subcommittees uh, as a way to kind of start processing all the different information we've gotten on all the different models. So look out for some emails to schedule subcommittee meetings. Um, and I'm really excited about all this stuff. I think we're really getting some momentum. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Amy. I think, you know, out of all the presentations that we've had, um, there's one that I that I haven't quite heard yet. And I, I, I could be mistaken. And I know our, you know, our, our, our law enforcement or South San Francisco Police Department have presented multiple times, but I'm wondering, have they ever presented on what they would like seeing that's different? Like what are some of their recommendations? Because I don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've heard that yet. I know they've presented on what they're doing, um, but, you know, like, how can we as a commission help them, you know, like, what are some things that they've noticed? Like, have they noticed that most of, you know, some of the officers are going to too many, you know, behavioral health calls versus, you know, um, responding to emergencies or to calls in, involving crime? Um, Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about that and if that's something they'd be open to talking about. Are they still here? I can't see actually. 
Yeah, there's still on. Um, uh, yes, go well, feel free to share whatever you like. Yeah. There we go. Um, no, great, great question, Chris Crystal. Um, just to keep you guys informed, um, this coming Friday, uh, I do have a meeting with all the stakeholders that are currently involved in the uh, the program uh, to talk about long term sustainability. Obviously, money th is the main factor. So, looking at uh, at uh, sources of funding uh, so that we can keep this long term, and, and also really decide whether it's a a South City thing or a county thing, right? So a lot of the programs that we've heard are San Francisco, which which has a million um, residents, Alameda County, very large. Uh, so it might make more sense um, financially uh, to sustain it long term to to be a a very large program that's run by the county. So we would have like a couple North County clinicians available twenty four seven, um, or you know a ten hour blocks here and there. And um, just pulling together all of our resources to to make this to make this happen and and to make uh, the availability uh, more present than it is now. Yeah, I definitely like that idea. Definitely it being a county thing because then it'll be a county job. I feel like there's a lot more. Um, yeah, and speaking to your last question, we we uh we really tried to find a, a clinician, a bilingual clinician, and uh, it was extremely okay. difficult. Um, just to find the four clinicians that we did get, it took several months. That's why the program was delayed. Uh, so we're, we're going to be facing the same challenges that you are in San Francisco and in Berkeley yeah. that we just heard from. So um, it's, it's going to be a challenge to, to get the right people, uh, the right fit for, for South San Francisco and the rest of the county. All right. Well, thank you, Chief Campbell. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, you know, um, if, if there's if there's stuff that we could help with to help put in our, our presentation to city council and, you know, maybe even something if, if, if it seems like it's everybody's on board with it, maybe it's something we could take to the county. Because um, I think I, I think that would be awesome for South San Francisco to definitely be like the spearheaders of like, this is what the rest of the county needs to look like. You know, definitely proud of being a South San Franciscan. So you guys are doing such a great job. So um, yeah, if, if there's something, could you just let us know that we could help put in our presentation? Cause I'm, I'm sure we'll kind of feel the same way about everything. Absolutely, appreciate that. Yeah, cool. All right, anything else? All right, Amy, Any, what's on next on that agenda? Um, just any items from commission or staff. And I already gave all the staff updates, so just be items from commission. Right. Any news from commissioners, shows? I I do have one interesting, I think, update. Um, SCRT, the South San Francisco response team that is modeled after cahoots, for some reason, um, let all of their clinicians go. So now it's not just... It's not just um, a paramedic and a peer. It used to be paramedic, peer, and a clinician. Now it's just a paramedic and a peer. So I'm not quite sure why San Francisco done, did that. And it's kind of, you know, taken everybody to process it. But it's just really interesting news that they had done that, considering how many, how vital clinicians are now. But I'm sure that there's something on the back end of why they did that. Any, anybody else yeah. have any other I, I have a show talking. coming up. It's Sorry. not related to mental health, although music does help, you know, relieve uh, stress and other mental health issues. But um, my band, Love Struck, will be performing at a local uh, venue in South City at Fort McKinley on March 25th at 8 o'clock. So hopefully you guys can come out and enjoy some good music. Well, thank you, Paula Claudine. Definitely always appreciate your invite to do something uh, relaxing and non-business, <laughs> something fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Another mm -hmm. commissioner? 
All right. Next, Amy. That's it. Just to adjourn. All right. All right. Well, have a great evening. I know this was long as, as, as usual, but we're definitely doing really good work here. And I think we're about, um, we're really close to being able to put the presentation together to make recommendations to city council. So um, when we hear back from Chief Campbell and from Captain Plank and what their recommendations are, make sure that we put that in there too. So this is a nice wrapped um, wrapped presentation for city council. So we are one team. So I just wanted to say that, but yeah. All right, well, stay safe out there. The winds are, the winds are nuts and uh, Make sure you got your generators ready because I was going out. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.